Okay, hello everyone, I'm Patrick Sannon. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Italian-speaking Switzerland, uh, just across the border from Italy. Um, I work on a uh, co-design project funded by the Swiss government uh, to develop preconditioners for large-scale geophysics problems. Um, but today I'll be talking about a different geophysics application that led me to Julia. Um, I think I'm one of the newer Julia users. I've been using it for about three months now, I think. Um, so anyway, the promise of Julia while we, while we started using it was that um, we'd like to be taking this sort of well-demonstrated concept that we can develop our scientific codes in Julia. We don't have to port them to C um, or Fortran or something like that. this. But as we saw with the cluster manager abstraction, there's also a way to incrementally um, parallelize your code, to move it to more and more complex architectures, to even run the same code on different architectures with completely different backends, um, with different synchronization mechanisms at some overhead, but um, at very low overhead to the programmer or even the person who has to run the code, which is me. Um, so this is really the dream, is to take code that was developed, you know, starting on a laptop um, by Lars and run it on a supercomputer. So this is a uh, bit stained at uh, CSCS, which stands for uh, Swiss National Supercomputing Center in Italian, um, in Lugano, where I live. Um, so the goal, is to, the goal is to take code written on this system, test it on this system, also test it on this system, maybe, and run it on the biggest systems in the world. Um, so as I said, uh, Lars Toto and uh, Odette Heiber have this um, electromagnetic inversion code, which we like to run. Um, in theory, this should be something we can do with Julia. Uh, they've already written things using um, the parallel processing capabilities in there. It works nicely. It's a well-parallelized problem. Uh, most of the sub-problems are solved um, running single forward problems on a, on a node. Um, but running this on the Cray ended up being actually quite difficult, and we spent you know, many weeks trying to figure out how to actually do this in an efficient way. Um, the biggest problem is that um, the way that these Cray systems are set up is that the user does not have direct access to the computing nodes. Um, in a lot of ways, this is a good thing for the user. It means that the, the uh, Linux system that they use can be optimized. Uh, Cray has their own brand of Linux, which they run on these compute nodes, um, which is very efficient, but it doesn't have things like you know, the ability to SSH from node to node. Um, which kind of throws away anything that the existing um, parallel processing could do. Um, the other alternative that we looked into is using the specific uh, API that Cray, Cray provides, or provides to uh, actually write our own cluster manager. So as Amit said, we could do this. Um, the tools uh, to develop these things in Julia are there, and some have been developed for exotic networks. Um, this is a daunting task because you know, their API is 200 pages long. I'm probably not going to use it efficiently. Um, and this doesn't really scale to doing this process on many supercomputers. Um, so the solution in our case here was to try and use the tools that we had efficiently. So most of my time on this project was spent asking people stupid questions as opposed to writing code. Um, but that actually worked. Um, so we don't have access to these compute nodes, but the flip side of that is that what is on those compute nodes is actually quite efficient. Um, Kind of the way that you interact with this system is quite different than most of the demos I've seen at this conference. Um, running interactively is not really something that's often done on these machines. It's usually done in some kind of a batch system. Um, the demo I'll show you is an interactive prompt. Um, so we give up on dynamic spawning of processes. There's no ad procs in our demos. Um, so really the solution is, as Amit uh, alluded to, is to use MPI for all the communication. So this is a nice thing to do because we have a very efficient MPI implementation on the system written by Cray, tuned by Cray, um, to use their backend, to use their special communication hardware. Um, and that hardware is really what makes this a supercomputer. So this Ares hardware is kind of the, the killer feature. The nodes are really Linux servers like you're used to. Um, so again, the key piece of software here um, that let us actually do this in the end was uh, all Amit's work. And it's actually not a huge amount of code. It's using MPI calls. Um, and again, those have been optimized by Cray. So this is a very sort of narrow um, Way, way to get the, uh, the job done that we need to do. And this is in MPI.jl right now. Um, so I'm going to go to show you this actually is pretty easy to go through the entire process of how we do this. So I log into the, uh, the computer. I clone Julia. Um, I do a couple of little hacks because their system picks, or the, the compiler picks up weird things in their system, this dtrace library. I don't even really know what this does, but I turn it off. Um, we, this loads up our new, our new compilers. So a nice thing about these systems is someone has come along and most of the time you do a one-liner, it loads all the compilers, all the MPI that you need. Um, we build this, we stay out of the way of everyone else on the node. Um, parallel make still doesn't work sometimes, so I run make twice, run the tests. 
Um, this is the way we actually run the code. Um, this is how you get an interactive session. That's what I'll show you. Um, load our compilers, export some things into the environment so that Julia knows where to look for shared libraries and this sort of thing. Um, and we can run a file. So running things is quite similar to running an MPI job. This is just a crazy name for MPI run. The difference is that when I call this function, it takes my executable, sends it to a remote node, and runs it there. So this is kind of the wall between the user and the compute nodes that you have to be very wary of when using these machines. All right, so the second stage is to get the MPI package working. Um, we can do this through Julia itself. Uh, the login nodes of this machine have the same software as the compute node, so we can just run Julia. We can run the REPL on the login node if we want to. Use the handy package uh, interface, get the master of MPI. Um, do a couple of little hacks here. For some reason, my, my CMake wasn't working. Um, pass in the sort of arcane names for the compilers on this system and install it. Um, this is the testing. So as a demo, I will show you kind of a stupid way to compute pi on this machine. So this is running this code, which is some of the only Julia code I've actually had to write. But essentially, it just calls a function which picks a random point in a square. And if it's inside a circle, it returns a count. And I can use this to calculate pi. So if this runs, which it should, I may have done something by resizing that. Anyway, we'll waste some Swiss electricity to do that. Hopefully, that'll actually run. All right, so why bother with this? Um, this is kind of esoteric hardware, but as I said, MPI exists in many places, so this will port to, uh, to other systems. Um, there are some challenges that are left. Uh, managing how this uh, allocates memory, there's still some bugs that need to be worked out. Um, we need to make sure we're actually using this computer effectively. Um, we could do many things in the cloud, as Amit said. Uh, that interconnect is really the thing. So in conclusion, I think that um, the promise is actually pretty realizable. I have not been using Julia for very long. Um, I didn't write this code. I wasn't very familiar with it when I started running it. Um, I wasn't that familiar with the hardware or with Julia or with anything, really. But um, by trying to be careful about where we interface things, um, I think it is, it is actually pretty simple to run these machines on, uh, on large clusters. So I want to thank uh, Lars Neldad, who wrote the code, uh, Fabio and Olaf in my group uh, in Lugano, uh, all the help support at CSCS, and of course, uh, I'm Viral and all of you for inviting me. All right, so I'll see if this did anything or not. That's very disappointing. I don't know what, what happened here. All right, so are there any questions? Yeah? Um, zero and Q run on the Cray here. Sorry, does what? Zero and Q run on the Cray. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, probably not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one either. <laughs> CMQ is like interprocess communication. Okay. And the nodes on a gray machine can't talk directly to each other, so. Yeah, so that was. not the hard part if it's nodes talking to each other. Yeah, so the first thing was that they have like, you know, sort of various modes to try and do this with the existing TCP communication, but it seemed like they were going to be both inefficient and also very difficult because they don't even guarantee to build this hardware yeah, on there. It doesn't allow you to run your code in slow way. <laughs> you have a question? Um, are you planning to type any scaling calls for your code? Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to work on, is once we're sure that the uh, cluster manager is working like it's supposed to, then that's kind of the next stage for this. Because, yeah, that, that's a great point, is that, again, this, this works nicely for embarrassingly parallel things. The interesting thing is to try and actually get some yeah, good scaling and some good performance out of this. This might be a question more for Amit, but uh, does all the does all the Julia stuff, whatever, whenever two Julia processes talk to each other now, with this cluster manager go through MPI instead of Julia's inbuilt sockets? Um, yeah, so there's no sockets at all involved in this, correct? MPI.js has got four modes of operation, so basic, uh, uh, first mode is where you don't need a cluster manager, all the Julia processes will run as like Julia masters and you have your MPI code and you do your regular MPI programming to make sure your MPI calls are synchronized with each other and stay uh, script run. And the other, the second mode is where your master is running on the laptop and you're launching uh, uh, MPI worker, but it's using TCP for communication. 
third mode is everything runs on the API cluster with the Softbase PIP. And what they're using on the Play Machine is everything runs on the supercomputer and they use MPI instead of the one for Cool. All right. Let's thank the speaker. Okay. <laughs>